Hi, I'm, I'm Don Berry. I'm a statistician for Berry Consultants. I design clinical trials. I build uh, models of disease and incorporate them into the design of clinical trials. I'm very interested in biomarkers and very interested in um, big data. So I'm going to try to relate to you um, a consistent story that seems pretty uh, different from various uh, uh, angles. So I'm going to talk about multiplicities. I'll tell you what that is. I'll talk about big data and the big inferential problems associated with big data, the observational issues, the, the large number of dimensions, and how that comes into play in drawing inferences. Um, in the course of it, I'll talk about reproducible research, or rather irreproducible research. Research that um, when people try to reproduce it, either in the context of the same uh, laboratory or experiment, um, or in a different uh, uh, context, they can't do it. And then the umbrella man. What on earth does the umbrella man uh, have to do with all of this? And um, what is the umbrella man? I'll tell you all of that, and I hope that it hangs together uh, in a consistent way so that one piece helps you better understand the other piece. So these are publications, starting with Johnny and Edith's um, uh, pathbreaking and revolutionary uh, publication in Plus Medicine um, in 2005, and then going to other uh, others who have noticed the difficulty in reproducing uh, results. Um, uh, uh, Jonah Lira writing in um, uh, the New Yorker talking about the truth wears off, and is there something wrong with the scientific method? Uh, what is a scientific method? Uh, trouble in the lab, uh, a similar story in The Economist. And then this uh, paper in Nature by uh, Glenn Bagley and Lee Ellis, um, where what they did is reported on a set of uh, studies that they had uh, gleaned from the uh, literature um, that reported on targetable, targetable uh, endpoints that you could uh, measure a genomic characteristic, for example, and ha build a drug that would target that characteristic, and they were mostly interested in, in cancer. Uh, this is when uh, Glenn Bagley was at uh, Amgen, and they report on 53 studies which um, they tried to reproduce, and of the 53, they reproduced six of them, and 47 they could not reproduce, even though they got the investigators in to Thousand Oaks at uh, Amgen to try to you know, help build a laboratory experiment. So what's wrong with this picture? Why couldn't they do it? Is it fraud? It's not fraud. It's none of what I'm talking about here is their purposeful deception. Maybe a very small percentage, you know, a fraction of a percent of uh, studies that you read about are fraud. Um, these are, are people who are duped by their own experiments, by their own observations. Most of the effect is due to multiplicities. And I'll talk about what that means. And what is not due to multiplicities, most of that is due to regression to the mean. And I'll tell you about that as well. So ob observational studies and multiplicities. Suppose you're traveling in a foreign land, and you, you go through the town of Oz, and you notice that in Oz, people seem to be tall, um, taller than in the rest of the country. And so you go back, you, you want to do some research, so you go back and you ask people, uh, their height, you ask them, you know, what their age is, and, and, and then uh, uh, keep track of that. Uh, and then you compare to the country uh, statistics, and you find that the average height in Oz is four inches greater than the rest of the country. Um, you're impressed by this. 
you had 25 individuals that you asked, you write back to your statistician and you uh, say, you know, these results are really impressive. I got a p-value of, um, of less than uh, 0 0.001, whatever that means. Um, um, it, it's a pretty uh, uh, impressive sort of an observation. And she says, well, you know, there are problems with this. Um, there, in calculating this, you assumed independence and a random sample, and maybe the sample wasn't random, um, that you were preferentially seeing people out and about, you were preferentially seeing people who were walking together. Um, and so the, the, the assumption of randomness may not be there. And you understand that. Um, and you say, well, um, I'll, I'll assume approximate randomness, and this is a pretty impressive result. And then she says something that you don't really understand. Um, she says, but I need to know the denominator. Um, you might have seen that people had redder hair than usual. You might have seen that people uh, walked with a limp. You might have seen that people um, uh, were overweight or were underweight or had, you know, a, an enormous variety of characteristics. And this observation that you made in terms of height may not be unusual in the context of these other things. Um, and you haven't told me the various things you might have seen. You didn't write to me when you went to other uh, uh, towns. And so the multiplicities are, um, uh, uh, may dominate, and what you've seen really has no utility and no reality. Another example, I don't know how many times you have read about coffee studies, but I, it, it seems like they are at least once a week in my newspaper that somebody reports that coffee is good for you, coffee is bad for you, co coffee is bad for you if you're uh, a man that's over age 60, coffee is bad for you if you drink more than four cups per day. It's bad for you if you drink decaf. There are thousands of studies. So I did a Google search, and it, uh, it uh, showed uh, you know, 30,000 results for coffee is bad for you with the quotes in. So those, that phrase had to be around. Uh, and uh, about four times as many for coffee is good for you. Uh, with the word study uh, uh, involved. What do you conclude from the corpus of this? I mean, what I conclude is that coffee is neither. You may look at this and say there's more studies that show coffee is good for you, so maybe that's true. But um, it's, what is more likely is that they are doing a study and they are seeing something in the study that is unusual. They may have asked about coffee, about uh, various other kinds of things associated with diet, uh, and observed that coffee had something of interest. And so they publish what is of interest. It's probable that nothing is true. So we learn by observation, but most of what we learn is wrong unless we know how to interpret what we see, that we look through glasses that have filters and that filter out the dross. Uh, here's an example. I'm a member of, a, of, a, um, uh, of something that, say, uh, a professional society, American Society of, uh, of Clinical Oncology, and every day I get these new newsletters in, in uh, email. And this is one particular day. There were five items of general cancer news, and they talk about uh, 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 BMI, um, body mass index, um, and it's a possible, possible association with colorectal cancer. Again, coffee, coffee associated with a particular type of cancer, H high fat diet, uh, women with irregular menstrual cycles, uh, individuals with declining mental skills may be less likely to die from, uh, uh, from cancer. These are observational studies. What they have in common is they're probably all wrong. And they're all wrong because they make an observation, they're looking at lots of things, and they see something and publish it. 
Um, in terms of clinical trials, we all that are in the business understand that there are too many failures in phase three. So we base the phase three design on the phase two design, and we pick uh, phase two trials, drugs that uh, led to phase two trials, that turned out to be positive um, uh, to go into phase three. And we power the study at 90%, but we don't observe anything like that in terms of success rate. In oncology, it's about 45%. Not 90%, but half of that. It means half of the studies that we thought would be successful are in fact failures. What's the reason? The reason is that we pick the phase two studies that showed a benefit and the next time we look, the benefit is not always there. And it's because we picked off we sort of cherry picking and, we, and in the phase two setting or in any kind of setting, there are big results and small results. And if we take only the big results, the next time we look, they're less big. Regression to the mean. It's a ubiquitous problem in um, medicine generally. It's probably the most important uh, principle that every researcher in medicine and in science should understand, that there is this inevitable regressing uh, to the mean the next time you do an experiment. So sometimes it's easy to tell when a, an experiment, in this case a clinical trial, is not reproducible. This is an example from Stroke, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on something called SAINT, um, a particular agent for acute ischemic stroke. And this is a table um, uh, that gives the results. And in particular, the primary endpoint, the thing that was the principal reason for doing the study was uh, modified Rankin scale. Um, and it's tabled here for the, for the various scores from zero to five. Um, and they calculated an odds, odds ratio, which was the primary analysis for the study, of 1.2 with a p-value that's statistically significant. Uh, now, what else about this table is of interest? There are other scores, not just the Rankin, but there's the NIH stroke score, there's the Bartel index, there are other things that are associated with is the uh, drug doing uh, anything to help patients who have stroke. Um, and my reading of these was not much. And moreover, stroke drugs are, um, there's only one drug that's approved for stroke, that's TPA, uh, and there are scores of trials, phase three trials, that have failed in stroke. And so take this as, you know, what is the prevalence of success? update by this table, which is kind of iffy, and I got my prediction for the next trial to be successful. Same type of trial, actually a mirror trial, that originally had 1,700 patients, but in view of the first trial results, they upped it to get 80% uh, power with an odds ratio of 1.2, that thing that, we, that uh, they observed in, in St. Juan. My probability that St. 2 was going to be effective, that would show a positive result, was 10%. Not 80%, 10%. And what do you expect? The press release, when it came out and announced the study, said it did not meet its primary outcome. The p-value was not significant. And moreover, the odds ratio was 0.94. What did that mean? It meant that placebo actually beat the drug. Uh, and not surprisingly, the company plans no further development of this uh, compound in, in, acu in acute ischemic stroke. It was a big blow to the company. It was a big blow to the stroke researchers who had uh, placed a lot of uh, hope in this. I had no hope. Multiplicities in big data. So building a prognostic uh, omic, uh, genomic, or proteomic, or whatever index based on Markers is a standard thing that people do in um, 
um, in, uh, in cancer and increasingly in other diseases. So I had data on 1,500 uh, women who were treated uh, in a, a clinical trial. Um, they had breast cancer, node positive breast cancer. And I had 20 markers, genomic markers, that I could use to try to build an index, something that would indicate which of these women were more likely to recur, to have their disease recur. And so I, I used these markers. I selected those that were pointing in the direction of having something to do with uh, recurrence, with uh, um, uh, uh, disease-free survival. And those that were, I used those to put together in the best way to come up with a recurrence score. And I got really very impressive results. Um, the, the above the median recurrence score you see is the, is the top, the, is in red here. Uh, below the median is in green. And the p-value associated with these was incredibly uh, uh, significant, less than 0 .0001. Uh, which means the result is really unusual. The punchline is that these 20 markers were nothing. They were white noise. They were just random numbers that I plugged in that had nothing to do with genomics, that had nothing to do with the disease. They could have been, you know, the price of, uh, of bananas in Costa Rica. Um, and, but with this white noise, if I tuned it to the outcomes, I was able to get something which was uh, incredibly predictive of the results in the study at hand. If I go to the next study, another 1,500 women who are randomized to whatever, and I use this prognostic index, it's going to show nothing. It can't show anything because it's white noise. The good news is I had a protocol, and that means I could go back and calculate, you know, under the context of nothing going on, how likely am I to see that something is going on? Uh, false positives are ubiquitous in medical research. They're, they're ubiquitous in big data, and it's because of the number of dimensions if you have, let's say, 20,000 genes that you're trying to see if the, any of these genes predict um, uh, who's going to progress in cancer, uh, you can do it. You can probably do it exactly. It will pinpoint exactly which patients are going to, uh, to progress, but the next time you try to reproduce it, you're going to fail. The big question is how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? It's an enormously important question in all research as we proceed in cancer, say, uh, we're going to have to understand who benefits from our therapies. And that's subject to all of these false positives. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, set of uh, uh, questions. So here's big data. I, I did a search um, uh, to see, you know, how often does this happen that people build these kinds of things or look for genes that are predictive of benefit or, or of effect? Um, and these are, happen to be three in a, a particular uh, uh, four-month period, 17-gene uh, assay to predict prostate cancer. Um, uh, prostate cancer researchers develop a personalized genetic test. Personalized genetic results uh, predict uh, risk of prostate cancer. These are probably all wrong. 95% of biomarker studies are crap. Uh, so uh, this is an article I wrote in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute that gives 10, you know, the top 10 things that you should do when you're doing a study like this. You need a protocol. You need to say what analyses you did, even though you're not reporting them. That is, we need to have a denominator. Uh, you need to say what you plan to do that, didn't, that you didn't do. Uh, and best if, is if you do confirmation. In fact, there are some journals that won't accept 
a biomarker study unless there is a completely independent set where you've uh, uh, confirmed the results. So, the Umbrella Man. What does this have to do with anything? What is the Umbrella Man? This is uh, a, a, a picture of a, um, a video from the New York Times. Um, it was an interview with uh, Josiah Thompson, who wrote uh, Six Seconds in Dallas, uh, which a report uh, of the Kennedy assassination. And he talks about something that they observed in, uh, in, in Dallas, in Dealey Plaza, at the, at the time of the assassination. Um, and he comments that, as you can tell from these shadows, it's a sunny day. Uh, November 22, 1963, in Dallas. Nobody's wearing a coat. Nobody has an umbrella because it's a beautiful day. They're not, there's, there, there's no rain. Um, and in November, it's not that hot in Dallas. Uh, and so you wouldn't be having an umbrella to keep the sun out. But there is a guy with an umbrella. And he has this, you know, he's holding it up high right as Kennedy is going by and right as the bullets fly and Kennedy is assassinated. At the time of the assassination, he's um, 30 feet from Kennedy, the only man in Dallas with an umbrella, um, as you see here. So there are people that uh, that uh, you know painted a pretty sinister picture of this. That um, and 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 one group uh, said, you know, this the, the CIA is working on a uh, flechette that's independently targeted and can be used with a fountain pen. The fountain pen can be the launching device or soda straws or an umbrella. Um, and the claim is that the umbrella was used to shoot the president. Uh, and that the paralyzing flechette was, this is something that they theorized went into Kennedy's throat. It's a tiny hole in Kennedy's throat that couldn't have come, they theorized, from the back. Because if it exits the throat, it's going to leave a big hole. This was a tiny hole. The paralyzing flechette, they claimed, was fired by this guy holding the umbrella. And they even have a picture of the, uh, the system that would, uh, that would do it, uh, where there's the trigger and the uh, independent self-propelled flechette that hit Kennedy and then the bullets rained uh, after the flechette paralyzed him. So uh, Thompson said that he asked the umbrella man to come forward, and he did. Uh, and he presented to the select House Committee uh, on Assassinations in 1978, and you see here, um, he showed up with his umbrella. And this is the person who claims to have been the umbrella man. And in the words of Thompson, um, what uh, what Witt said was the open umbrella was a kind of protest, a visual protest. It wasn't against Kennedy's policies as president. It was a protest against the appeasement policies of Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, who was ambassador to Great Britain uh, in the years before, immediately before World War II. And it was a reference to the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, Neville Chamberlain, who always had an umbrella. Uh, as you see here with Hitler uh, and his, uh, his uh, constant uh, umbrella, uh, here he is with Hitler and with Kennedy, and here he is reviewing the troops. Um, appeasement, and so not recognizing the threat um, and was very much uh, lampooned here in a cartoon. British prestige, British prestige is fraying uh, because of Chamberlain's uh, uh, appeasement. And of course, here's his umbrella keeping him on the tightrope. 
Um, and he was uh, further lampooned in uh, this, uh, this uh, picture of um, uh, Hitler saying something funny that his maid is laughing at, and obviously he said it in English. I'm, I'm joking. Um, uh, that uh, he, 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 I said to him, uh, Neville, uh, you go back and tell them there'll be peace. So Thompson continues, uh, he said, I read that and I thought, this is just wacky enough, that has to be true. And I take it to be true. Uh, what it means is that if you have any fact which can only point to some sinister underpinnings, hey, forget it, man, because you can never, on your own, think of all of this non-sinister, uh, perfectly valid explanations for that fact. A cautionary tale. And what's cautionary about it is the unusual nature. We all see things that are unusual in everyday life, um, in clinical trials, in data that we see, in observational studies, and much of it is not real. So what it's indicating, there's this sporadic element, there's this random element that sometimes gets big and looks like it might be real. Most of the time, it's not. On the other hand, uh, as I told you about uh, Thompson and the Umbrella Man and his particular view, uh, others don't accept it. Uh, and here is a case where uh, a guy says the case is not closed, the Umbrella Man is still uh, viable and that uh, there's a conspiracy with the CIA. Um, and, and it, so it's, it's, it's uh, not closed. So I've told you about multiplicities. Multiplicities are these things, lots of possibilities can happen. And when you see one, maybe it's real, but maybe it's not. The problem is huge because the data are huge in big data. There's lots of data, lots of dimensions. You're going to see things that aren't real. On the other hand, we have to do it. We have to understand. Uh, what are the genes that are associated with uh, the, the various maladies that we, uh, that we have among us and, and that we're uh, working to fight? Uh, irreproducible research. Um, and nobody knows how to improve the circumstance. It was a PCAST panel that you can, uh, you can uh, 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 view uh, in January of uh, 2014. PCAST is the President's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology that addressed this question, you know, how can we teach uh, researchers uh, about the need to reproduce and about the multiplicities associated with uh, the, uh, the lack of reproducibility. And the Umbrella Man is maybe a bit of a stretch, but it's exactly the same principle. What you see may be real but it may simply be somebody who is doing something that you could never imagine yourself doing and that the unusualness is not sinister at all and it's not indicative of any uh, reality associated with the circumstances such as the, the uh, assassination. So it all is talking about the same sorts of issues. These are major problems in medicine. They're not insurmountable. If they were insurmountable, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing because I do think that we can get to the wheat, but we'll have to get through the chaff first. Thank you.